Arjuna, Goa, India, about 100,000 Israelis come every single year to make this a home, whether it be for a month, three months, or in many cases, the whole year. They're coming here because the weather, the scenery, the party life, the adventure, um, the freedom. Many of the Jews living in Goa are craving, yearning, whatever it may be that makes them feel like Goa is, is also a place where Judaism can be found. How important it is that there be a permanent place of Judaism in Goa, India. For the locals, for the visitors, for the travelers, it's missing. I'm living here 12 months. We need a Chabad house because we have a community who is living here and we don't have the support. And if you have your mikveh, and meat, wine, everything, wine. Wine, everything, we don't have nothing. Yeah. So if you don't have nothing, so it's meaning we need everything. We need to make a permanent uh, dira for Hashem, Beit Chabad. Hashem, Ezrat Hashem, Naseh Benatzliach. No, there's no Beit Chabad. 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 It's Friday afternoon in Goa. A young couple who just got married comes to Goa, India from Paris, France. And they're looking for kosher food and a Shabbat. I was on my scooter and his wife saw the beard and the tzitzit and she said, okay, we have Shabbat. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. I, I had never a uh, place to go for Shabbos, and you give me uh, your wine, you give me your, your sympathy, you give me uh, your smile, you give me everything. Is that we want it because we are alone here. We need everything that a Jew needs in Goa, just like they need in Brooklyn, just like they need Thank in, in Yerushalayim. Those same people are here. We learned this lesson from the Shluchim who first came to India, Gabi and Rifki, Holzberg, that there's no such thing as giving up. When, it's, when Hashem sees that you want, and Hashem sees that you care, and you trust that you're gonna get whatever you're looking for, Hashem will make it that you find it. Go India feels like a cooking uh, inside of a pot. Between the parties, between the nightlife, between the weather, the beaches, the culture. A Jew comes to go and he gets cooked. And eventually, he becomes hard. Come looking for who they are, internally. Urgent, urgent, urgent. This guy named Chaim Knesset from Brooklyn, New York, date of birth 227.89. There's no Chabad people in the Goa and neither in Mumbai. They all left. The bottom line is he's drowned in Anjuna. We need to um, get as much information and to take care of the body and whatever we need to do. So by Hashkacha Pratis, the only person who's Jewish and a rabbi or whatever is me and you and us, that we are here. And by Jewish law, someone needs to guard the body. And the family doesn't know, nobody has positively identified the body. Nobody, no Jewish person has, knows what's going on right now. So what we're doing is we're going in the car, we're going for an hour drive to a place we've never been before, in the middle of India, nowhere. We're packing a bag with some clothes and my tefillin, and we're gonna sleep in the uh, morgue with the body, because we got emergency information from Bombay that they wanna do a surgery. So we're at the morgue.
Funky Monkey was his name. He was staying at the hostel. He was a photographer, huh? Yeah. Hi. His birthday is 227.89. You have to let me see. I don't want them to fly from New York. There's a 25 hours flight. I don't know. If, I don't think it's his. What? You don't think it's his? This is not the person I saw. I mean, I don't know. So listen, so we need to talk. We, we, we need to talk about other things now, okay? Can you give me a photo of the tattoo? <coughs> yeah, I'll send you Left, one. left arm. Yes. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. It's terrible. It's really bad. Baruch Dayana MS. And someone needs to be with him at 7.30 in the morning, on, on Thursday morning. And this is very serious, you know, halakha stuff. So if now, let, let's, just, let's just say we've positively identified him. So now we have to give him covet. And give him covet, mean, give him covet means we need to get the body out of here. We want the body to go to Israel? Okay, your parents do not know now? They don't know what's going on? They do not know. I need to tell them in person. I'm driving. There's only one thing you have to know right now. Is that right now, more than ever in your whole life, Hashem is right next to you. And I know... And, and, and if, you can, if you can just hold on to that feeling that you're going to walk this whole thing with Hashem really, really close, then it's going to go good. Okay? You didn't sign up for this, and I didn't sign up for this, and now we just have to hold on to Hashem's hand. You said you want to tell them in person, though. Yes, absolutely. It was a, it was a drowning. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Please don't, please, please don't, don't cry, okay? Baruch Hashem, we are able to identify it and at least give the family closure. Let the family know that it is indeed their 28-year-old son who passed away, drowned. And uh, you know, we, this is uh, this is what Chabad has to do. Is, we're on the ground, and Hashem has entrusted us with these special missions. There's nobody else here. We're in the Goa airport, we're on the tarmac, and we're heading to Mumbai, where we're accompanying the body to Mumbai, where it will rest for Shabbos, and then from there we're going to Eretz Israel Sunday morning. Going to Mikva, forget about Davening Mint. Let's go, let's go. Tomorrow morning we leave to Eretz Israel, Mirz Hashem, that we should be in Eretz Israel by uh, the, the Levaya at 9 30 or 9 50 p.m. in Eretz Israel with the body, Chaim Nasan. May his neshama have an aliyah, Baruch Dayan MS, And we will meet the family for the first time. The family has flown from New York. This neshama and this event taught us that life is all about helping another person. You need to come to the morgue at 2 in the morning, you come to the morgue at 2 in the morning. You go to the police station and they're speaking another language. This was an out-of-world experience. I never thought I could have done 
three days with almost no sleep, three days with, Friday I did not eat. We traveled uh, 95 degrees and humid, to not eat, nothing. To come to Shabbat with no shower, taking off my clothes in the middle of the lobby, taking out my money, take, I never did something like this. And it felt like I was doing all what the Shem wanted. Chaim was like the, the, aside from being the strongest and best looking guy that I knew, he was just, he was so fun and he loved life and he loved to, to, to explore and he loved to, to, to be wild and to have fun and, and he loved to pull me out of my comfort zone of being afraid of, of doing things because <laughs> I'm afraid of, uh, of pretty much everything. More recently, my wife went to visit her grandfather in Florida and um, thank God I have four kids at home. The oldest is seven, and uh, you know it's not—it's not always easy to <laughs> to watch them uh, alone. So when Chaim heard about that, he said, "I'm coming over," and I was like, "Really? You're gonna—you're gonna come over?" And he said, "I want to come over and help you." So he came over for two days, slept over, and did everything. He fed my kids breakfast. He, he helped me drive them to school, um, pick them up. He helped me shop. We did a shop at the grocery store. He helped me unload and, uh, you know, clean up the house. It was things like that that made me love Chaim, and we had such, a, such an amazing friendship. And I know that he, he treated me that way, and I saw that he treated others that way. And uh, I'm gonna miss Chaim. So I met Kaz back um, with, with you in, in Florida, Florida, and we spent the whole weekend with him, and it was amazing. Was we had a great time. Uh, then he went to the army, and, and after the army, we all kind of came back to in, in college for sure. We we had so many good times with Kaz. It's crazy, like you know, this stuff happens, and it's crazy, and you know, and like the last few weeks, we've all just been reminiscing, you know, going through pictures, going through videos, and like I realized, like I didn't, you don't think about it, but now you look back, you're just like, holy cow, we've done so much, yeah. we've been on so many trips, so many experiences. Like this poor kid passes away before he hits 30, but. The experiences that he built up in those 30 years are just out about of control. How much he's done over his 29 years. I mean, people live that people, people live 90 years and, and don't see the not even close. Saw, don't go to the countries really that he not went even to. close. Don't make the relationships and connections that he did with people yeah. from all over the world. Orange. Yeah. Hey. Whoa. Hi. Yeah. We have a group, Team Fun, and Kaz was Captain Fun. He really was. He really was. You know, we just throwing out like. <laughs> what was cool about Kaz is, I think we all can say this is he was a little more out there than all of us. Like, it's it's amazing. Like yeah. we wouldn't have done half the stuff that we did if it wasn't for Kaz. I think the main message, at least that I take out of Kaz, is is really, and I said this earlier, is just live every day. Thinking about Kaz, and it's like he really, truly every day lived to the fullest. He was really just about, I got today in front of me, what are we doing today? How are we having a great time? How are we having fun today? You know, what if, God forbid, you know, Kaz's whole life, he actually followed the path that everyone tells you to follow. You know, go to a good college, work really hard, go get yourself a job, nine to five, you pass away at 29, and you look, turn around and be like, what did I just do with my years? Even his last trip to India, he, his biggest struggle in life was, where do I travel? I've been everywhere. Like, he's like, I guess I gotta go to India. I've been everywhere else. He's been everywhere, he really has. He's lived it up.